Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 244. And today we are covering the Heaney family and the Balloon Boy hoax, which is a Colorado story that we have wanted to cover for a really long time oh, yeah. now. It's fascinated us for years and years. And there's actually a lot more to this story than you may realize. So I'm really excited to get into this today. Plus, we wanted to have a little bit of fun today because our last two episodes have been really Very heavy serious. and intense. Very dark. Yeah. So we wanted to have some laughs and the Heaney family definitely provides But that. there is crime yes. in this. Don't be mistaken. Yes. Maybe just not the typical violent crime, but there is crime in this episode. So mm -hmm. technically, this is a true crime episode. That's right. But also like some UFO action in there, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very in some interesting characters. Let's put it that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> interesting to say the least. Before we get into today's episode, though, we have a very exciting announcement, and it comes from our CBD company, Higher Love Wellness. After lots of time and development <laughs> yeah. and just fine tuning this new product line, we are pleased to announce our new relaxing, calm sleep collection mm -hmm. in a wonderful new scent flavor called Lunar Lavenberry. This is my favorite product that, or collection of products that we've ever put out. They're so good. I've wanted to make a sleep line since we started Higher Love, and it took a long time to get it right, but here they are. These gummies, you guys, the Lunar Lavenberry gummies, they are so good. I am extremely impressed with how they turned out. They almost have like a cotton candy taste. It's them. very interesting because the gummies definitely have kind of their own unique flavor because what we did is we took lavender and then we took blackberry and we bred the two together yeah, we did they and, had a baby and this is it and in the gummy form it tastes kind of like cotton candy but then we also have our uh tincture or oils that you can add to tea or other drinks mm -hmm. and it's got more of a milder kind of more lavender taste to it with a, like yeah. hints of berry in there it's great and like your nightly tea i love having it with mine but the cool thing about our CBD sleep products is that it does not contain melatonin, which a lot of products out there contain melatonin, but there's, you know, there's good things with melatonin. There's also some not so good things with melatonin. Mm -hmm. But what we wanted to do was only use cannabinoids in our uh, sleep line. So instead of just having CBD in there, we have a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD and CBN, which is another cannabinoid that lives in the cannabis plant, which is pretty cool. And what's cool about this particular cannabinoid is that they've done some research and they found that the properties that CBN actually exhibits in the body are oftentimes along the lines of sedation. So we're not talking like this will like knock you out in five minutes, but this is going to give you that gradual sort of drowsiness you're looking for when you're trying to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So you want to, especially with the gummies, take them about 30 minutes uh, before you head to bed. And you'll just kind of feel your body start to chill out a little bit and you'll start hopefully feeling a little sleepy. Yeah, we've uh, been testing these ourselves for the past, what, like? Six, probably like three or four eight, months, maybe even more than that. longer than yeah. that. Yeah, like since September. Oh, we've wow. We've been taking yeah. them like every night. They really do help, help they do. with falling asleep. They also help you dream. They do. That's been my personal experience. But... <laughs> They're very delicious. They come in the gummies, the tinctures. We also have mm -hmm. them in a vape cartridge yep. and a concentrated wax. I wish I could take the gummy right pen. now, but I'd be falling asleep. Yeah, I wish I could record. demo this on, on camera a little bit more, but um, YouTube is not too kind to the CBD world yet. Yeah, so that's true. But yeah, head over to higherlovewellness.com. Check it out. It is now available. We do ship to a bunch of different countries, except for Canada. I'm sorry, my fellow Canadians. Talk to your government about that one. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we do ship to all 50 states. This is 100% legal. There is no THC in our products, which is kind of cool. We use broad spectrum CBD, so it doesn't have any THC in there. So if you're worried about that at all, there's none of that in there. So And we do ship to a few other countries besides the United States. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the Just big one, UK, most of the mm -hmm. UK, we can, we can ship to. And there's a bunch of others on our website. But check it out, higherlovewellness.com. It's available now. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And also, today, Janelle and I, and Josh is in a black shirt too, but Janelle and I are wearing black dresses. Woo. And we have little pins too. Why are you wearing black dresses? 
Yeah, thank you. My pin says, ask me about my dress. So a nonprofit called the Junior League of Colorado Springs is putting on a program called the Little Black Dress Initiative, and we loved what it stood for, so we wanted to get involved. The Junior League, specifically the location of Colorado Springs, is an organization of women committed to developing the potential of women and improving the community. They are dedicated to providing resources to youth and young adults who are currently or formally in foster care. Its main purpose is to help fill gaps in individuals' transitions from foster care to independence and reduce the risk of homelessness, human trafficking, and domestic violence. And one of the main ways that they do this is through grants. The grants are available for needs related to health and well-being, education and cultural development, living expenses, and employment support. Little Black Dress Initiative, hashtag LBDI, put on by the Justice League of Colorado Springs, is a week-long awareness campaign that uses social media in order to educate people about issues in Colorado Springs specifically. This year's campaign runs from March 14th to March 21st. This is a really important cause because half of all foster children will end up in homelessness within two years of aging out of the system. A third of chronically homeless adults are former foster children, which is pretty shocking. And half of the entire prison population grew up in foster care. Young women from foster care are five times more likely to become pregnant compared to their peers. So people participating, which we invite you guys to join in, are wearing the same black dress and button for five consecutive days to represent the restrictions poverty places on choices, opportunities, and access to resources. So you can follow along on their social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and make a difference today. If you join in and start posting, you can use the hashtag JLCS and hashtag ask me about my dress. You can also make a donation. There are tons of leagues throughout the country, so we will leave a link below for you to pick which one that you would want to donate to. We know that was a long intro, so thanks for listening. And we will now get into talking about the Heaney family and the Balloon Boy hoax. What you all see right there is an experimental aircraft that inside of which is a six-year-old boy. Apparently KUSA, their photojournalist, is on the scene is saying that uh, there was nobody in this compartment, uh, that the compartment uh, is empty. I'm so cynical. I just wasn't quite buying in the whole thing. They're good kids. He gives them a lot of free reign, but on the other hand, I think he's a very responsible, caring parent. Yeah! Yeah! Okay, because you can't mentally compete with me. That is a bear scratch. We have evidence at this point to indicate that it was a publicity stunt. I'm kind of appalled after all of the um, feelings that I went through up and down that you guys are trying to suggest something else. Okay, I'm really appalled. Absolutely no hopes. You guys know that Josh and I love HelloFresh. In fact, I just placed our order for next week picked out all our meals right here on the app. It is so easy to do, and we have a box waiting for us when we get home. You can make mealtime easy with delicious recipes made from fresh, wholesome ingredients delivered to your door. No lines, no hassle, just great tasting meals that you can whip up and enjoy in the comfort of your home. Plus, you may not know this, but March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories with one third less sodium. With the cost of groceries going up and up, now is the perfect time to get started with HelloFresh because HelloFresh is actually cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. Plus they now have 40 weekly recipes to choose from and it is hard to narrow down your picks. There's meals for all occasions, lifestyles, and preferences. You can take your pick from meals like soy glazed salmon with rice or mushroom and chai risotto. And HelloFresh knows that you're busy. That's why they take care of the meal planning and prepping, pre-portioned ingredients, foolproof recipes, and convenient doorstep delivery. HelloFresh makes it easy to get dinner on the table. So get started today at HelloFresh.com slash MileHire60 and use code MileHire60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash MileHire60. Use code MileHire60 for 60% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. So today's wild story begins with two very interesting people to say the least. Richard Heaney and Mayumi Izuka. Back in the 90s, Richard and Mayumi met at an acting class, perfect for them, in Hollywood, California. And both also of them, perfect for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and clearly both of them were trying to make it in the industry. After she spent a year teaching English to high school students, Mayumi immigrated to the United States from her native country, Japan, in 1987. She then enrolled in Santa Monica City College 
and she had always been an offbeat sort of woman with dreams of becoming an actress. Back in Japan, Mayumi had actually been the guitarist with an all-girls rock band named Women. And Richard had tried to make it as a storm chaser in California's Central Valley back in the 90s. From there, he moved to LA in 1991 to try his hand at stand-up comedy. But this didn't take off because he is funny in ways that I think he doesn't quite understand. (laughs) He then tried to make it as an actor, but that didn't work out either. But one thing that did come out of this endeavor was meeting Mayumi. She was quickly swept off her feet by Richard's charm. They fell in love, and three months after they met, the two got married in Nevada on October 12th, 1997. And they ended up having three sons together, Bradford, Rio, and Falcon. The family did live near Los Angeles, and they really struggled to make ends meet. The couple tried to make money doing demo reels for actors, but it just wasn't enough to pay the bills. After they were evicted from their Burbank home in June 2007, they moved on over to Fort Collins, Colorado. Richard had actually been a storm chaser since the 1970s, and he thought Colorado would be a much better place to chase storms. Which, if you're not familiar with Fort Collins, it's like a little over an hour north of Denver. Um, It's not that big of a city. I think the population back then was like a little over 135,000. But one fun fact I found that all you Disney fanatics will find interesting is that Disneyland's Main Street was actually modeled after historic Old Town in Fort Collins. Really? Yes. Actually, I can totally see that now. Right? Well, I, I actually, I don't remember anything about Disney. But <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you, you've never been to Disney, but you've been to Fort Collins. Sure have. Definitely. Who told Richard that Fort Collins was where you chase the storms? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, there's there's you storms up north up there. Up there. There is, but it's like storm chasers are usually looking for the good stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's not that much. Like tornadoes and massive thunderstorms. Like there's definitely more of that up north, but still I'm like... Mm. So yeah, tough. not like the hub. No, it's sure. like if you're going to be a storm chaser, you got to head to Tornado Alley, baby. <laughs> That's where it's at. <laughs> Apparently, one of their tornado chaser friends recommended the Fort Collins area to them. Storm chasers can make money selling footage of storms, so Richard figured he could potentially support his family that way. That and his inventions, which combined his carpentry skills with his love of science. Richard was obsessed with inventions. He wanted to be an inventor and make all sorts of different innovative products. Some of these were marketed in that sort of late 2000s commercial style. Think OxyClean, ShamWow type stuff, but turned up like 10 (laughs) notches. The ShamWow. Let's take a look at some of these commercials. Hi, I'm Inventor Richard Heaney, and boy, I love my truck. Hi, I'm Inventor Richard Heaney. If you itch like a son of a twitch, then you need my latest invention, the patent pending bear scratch. I'm going to use my pickup to pick up hot chicks. That's why I invented the all new Heaney Duty Truck Transformer. Yes, 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 yes. This guy can't be serious. Can't find your back scratcher, huh? Well, there it is right there. That's bear scratch. Where is it? There it is. Where is it? It's right there. It's right here. Oh, yeah. Bear scratch. You can't lose it. Now that's a bear scratch. That is a bear scratch. Ah! I'm telling you, man. That's good what idea, I'm talking honestly. about. <laughs> you Not would a use bad that. invention. Like get in the corner and go <laughs> <laughs> scratch it off. <laughs> the guy is a character. He's a he's. So he, I'm surprised he didn't energy. do better in Hollywood, man. That's the energy Hollywood's <laughs> looking for. But I think they're looking for a little less than that. A little bit more like controlled mm-hmm. chaos. Not like you just smoke some crack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he's definitely um, had a few Red Bulls or something. Mm. Oh, I think more than Red <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say a few sniffs of something else. So Richard, as you just saw, an absolute shameless self-promoter. According to some of his old coworkers, they said he would do anything to promote whatever crazy new invention or business idea that he dreamt up that that morning. As you can see, he is a much larger than life personality he's like <laughs> the pillow guy times a million yeah times a million or billy sure. mays billy mays here yeah <laughs> wait is billy mays um the oxy clean yeah. didn't he die yeah i was just saying okay he kind of reminds me of like case. that have you seen that um 
deal and Doug guy, the car guy. Oh yeah. Or nobody beats the deal and Doug deal. Nobody. nobody. <laughs> yeah. It's like that car salesman. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, energy there. Mm -hmm. Love it. And by contrast, Mayumi was a stoic and hardworking woman who was very loyal to her family. And people who knew her said that sometimes she was sort of submissive to Richard. Richard had began hosting his own science web show. Love that for him. It was called The Science Detectives, but that was spelled P-S-Y, science. Mm. And this show, along with Richard's eccentric personality, caught the attention of producers at the show Wife Swap. Another wonderful production. It is. Honestly, Wife Swap's good. Yeah, we've watched a few seasons of Wife Swap mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. We always joke around, like, who would we Wife Swap with? Excellent content. Yeah. Good stuff. So, of course, when they got a load of this guy, they wanted the Heenies to appear on the show. And at first, Richard didn't really want to, surprisingly, but they were offering to pay him handsomely. So, Richard realized he could use that money to promote himself and fund his research or maybe pay the bills that were stacking up. So, in October of 2008, the Heenies appeared on the reality TV show. The show described them as science obsessed storm chasers who lived life on the edge. Mayumi swapped with the wife of a Connecticut family who was big on safety. I love that wife swap finds like polar opposite families to swap oh, with. <laughs> it's so That's funny. what makes it good. <laughs> During the show, many viewers considered Richard's behavior to be bizarre, to say the least. He later said that he was putting up sort of an act for the cameras, which is common in reality TV. But as we go through the story, you can decide how much of an act this really was. Now, what's a damn shame is Wife Swap is really strict with the copyright and we can't put in any clips damn it. from the show, but they are so worth watching. So we're going to link them below so you can check it out if you haven't seen it already because it is TV gold. Oh, people. yeah. Oh, yeah. The Heenies decided that they could leverage this Wife Swap appearance so that they could star in their own science themed reality show. Imagine this guy teaching your children about science. He could be Bill Nye times yeah. 10. <laughs> Bill Nye on crack. <laughs> Backcountry <laughs> Bill. <laughs> so they pitched the network their concept, the Science Detectives. Richard had been running this already as sort of a web show since 2007. Every time I hear a web show, you know, you know it's good. Now that's not copyrighted, so we can play a little bit of that. This is the song. Let's hear it. Oh my god. <laughs> so good. Not the clip. Oh yeah. Look at it. Explain everything on earth. Comments to tornadoes and the secrets of birth. The broad information from a new perspective watch. Richard Haney, science detective. Richard Haney, the science detective. Damn. Oh my god. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. A woman named Barbara. Slusser worked as Richard's business partner on the show, and she even became friends with the family too. But Richard's personality <laughs> drove her away. However, she really liked Mayumi. She described her as a highly intelligent person with a beautiful soul, but she was sort of under Richard's thumb. Barbara said that Mayumi was Richard's rock, and she should be put up for sainthood for having to deal with his ass. Barbara also said that whatever Richard says goes, She's basically his slave. Scott Stevens, another one of Richard's former friends and business partners, confirmed this sort of controlling dynamic in the Heaney household. He said that Richard wanted a wife that would obey him, and he believed that Asian women were more subservient to men. Sexist and racist. Excellent. Barbara noticed that Mayumi really needed a friend during this time. When Richard wasn't around, Mayumi would confide in her about her marriage. So these are some of the things that Barbara noticed. So when Richard and Mayumi met, she still didn't speak English very well, but Richard really worked to wow her. And from the day that they got married, he really controlled Mayumi's life. Richard knew that gender roles in Japan were less equal, and he used this to his advantage. Mayumi's father had also been very overbearing and abusive to her, and she'd left this hard situation in Japan just to go and meet Richard. So sadly, she was escaping one bad situation just to land in another. Barbara said that Mayumi suffered in silence 
when she would come over for dinner, Mayumi would do all the cooking. She'd even stay in the kitchen while the others ate. And when guests would invite her to come and eat with them, she would actually get uncomfortable and politely decline. Then the boys would come through the house, say they're hungry, and eat ice cream with Mountain Dew on top. Richard just let them have free reign, so the four of them basically ran the house. Not gonna lie, that sounds kind of good. Sounds bomb. Ew. Mountain Dew on ice cream? Mm, sounds, sounds good. Mmm. Like a Mountain Dew on top so. of vanilla ice cream? Ooh. Mountain Dew is... Delicious. You like Mountain Toxic. Dew? Toxic. Yeah, I like Mountain Dew. I'm not a big fan of it, Mountain actually, like but I feel like it would be good on ice cream. Personally, Gasoline. I prefer the Baja Blast Mountain Agreed. Dew. Have Agreed. you tried the Baja Blast Zero? No. I they tried it the other. Baja Blast Zero? Yeah, they have a Baja Blast what, Zero. What Zero sugar. Mean? Oh, I don't like that. And it tasted like about what you'd think Baja Blast Zero would taste. Do they Anything sell that at the store? The sugar is gross. It was nasty. Nasty. I, I will say Baja Blast. Is, if there is a Mountain Dew, that's good. It's Baja Blast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, anyway. on, but on ice cream, no. Let's stick to that classic A&W, baby. <laughs> on the ice cream. But anyway, Barbara said Mayumi accepted poor treatment even from her young sons because they were male. So the kids would be out of control and Mayumi couldn't do anything about it. Richard was always involving the boys in his latest science scheme. They appeared in his commercials and web show videos. Meanwhile, Mayumi was off to the side doing whatever Richard told her to do. And it was definitely his way or the highway. I mean, would you want to fight with that guy? No, no. He's unhinged, as as we'll see. Promotional content from the 2008 Wife Swap episode said that Richard called Mayumi his, quote, ninja wife. Whew. Idiot. This was because she took care of the equipment, drove the storm chasing car, stayed with the kids, and filmed. Meanwhile, Richard was off on his dirt bike, launching rockets at tornadoes. The promo materials also advertised this statement, quote, while Richard devotes every moment to his research, he expects Mayumi to cook, clean, and run the house without any help. So it's no surprise that Richard acted the way he did during Wife Swap. At one point in the episode, while Richard argued with Karen, the I love wife that they gave him a Karen. To do <laughs> I know, this. I was just going to say that. <laughs> who was the wife that Mayumi swapped with? He shouted, You're a man's nightmare. I'm so glad my wife was born in Japan. No words. Barbara said that the blowups that viewers saw on Wife Swap were daily occurrences. Richard isolated Mayumi from other people, and Mayumi wondered if American women normally lived with their husbands like this. She asked Barbara, is there something wrong with the way we live? But when she was pressed on the issue, Mayumi would say that nothing was wrong and that she was totally happy. Scott, Richard's friend, stated that he cut ties with Richard in 2008 over ethical concerns. Part of it had to do with storm chasing, but it was also the way he treated Mayumi and his financial dealings. Scott said that he had so many red flags that it was a forest. So one night in February of 2008, the police received a 911 hang-up call from the Heaney house. And when a deputy arrived at their house, he heard a man yelling from inside and a woman making a sound that sounded like a squeal. He then talked to Mayumi outside and he said that she had a mark in her cheek and broken blood vessels in her left eye. But Mayumi told the detective that she was just having a problem with her contacts. The area around her eye started to swell and turn red, but still, Mayumi wouldn't look the deputy in the eye. The Larimer County DA's office never pressed charges due to lack of evidence. The first Wife Swap episode wasn't supposed to be the family's last appearance on the show, though. They became fan favorites in the franchise. For their 100th episode, ABC decided to let viewers vote on which two families would make another appearance for the ultimate swap, and the Heenies were one of them. The other family included a psychic mother who claimed she could talk to the dead and control the weather. The episode was recorded and set to air on October 29, 2009, but in light of the events we're about to discuss, it was pulled and never aired. Promotional copy for the episode read, when the Heaney family aren't chasing storms, they devote their time to scientific experiments that include looking for extraterrestrials and building a research gathering flying saucer to send it into the eye of the storm. This will be important to remember later. On the March episode of Wife Swap, Richard said he believed that humans were direct descendants of aliens. He also stated that once he passed out in a fast food restaurant and heard aliens speaking to him. <laughs> Been there too, man. Been there too. <laughs> I really want to know what fast food restaurant. Burger King, for sure. <laughs> he would go to Burger King. Arby's, though. Sometimes 
That meat, baby. Ew. Got you see an alien. <laughs> so Richard started working on a 3D low altitude vehicle, his next crazy invention. And this would basically be a huge helium balloon that people could take out of their garage and basically fly around in. <laughs> Sounds really safe. Instead of sitting in traffic for the morning commute, people could fly 50 to 100 feet above the streets and land at their destination in no time. So they were actually working on this balloon for about eight months before the incident we're about to discuss. And it was about 20 feet long in diameter and five feet tall. The outside was made of tarps covered in aluminum foil. So the thing looked like some type of flying saucer or UFO. Cherie, the wife that they swapped with for their second appearance, said that Richard actually had her help out with the balloon. And here's what she had to say about swapping with the Heaney family. And you don't want to do a damn thing. Miami start the project, and she finished it, and you suck! What was it like to be on Wife Swap with Richard? <laughs> oh, um, being on Wife Swap with Richard was very challenging. He is definitely um, a very eccentric, um, aggressive, um, uh, talented, creative person. Him and I talked a lot about extraterrestrials and flying saucers, and he had me fix his flying saucer and clean it and carry it out to the backyard. Uh -huh. And so a lot, of, a lot of our conversations were about um, me doing his experiments on me because I'm a psychic, so he had all these different experiments on me. Right. Uh, he had me in a cage, a copper cage, and it, it wouldn't have put it past Falcon to jump in there because he did jump in the spaceship that Richard built when I was cleaning it. So. Right. You know, it, it would be something that he would do. Damn, I wish we could see that episode. What a shame. <laughs> like it was like, she's like, yeah, he was doing experiments on me, like putting me in a copper cage. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> like, oh, I see why this didn't air. So in April of 2009, the family signed an option with the wife swap producers to pitch a show about their unconventional family and homemade science experiments that they created. And one of the ideas that the Heenies came up with for the show was a flying saucer balloon, of course. Richard worked odd jobs while they waited for the deal to go through, and once he cleaned a backyard piled with dog poop for $300. Richard sadly remembered taking the job, saying, quote, I've never been so embarrassed. So obviously, Richard was eager to get started working on this show. By October of 2010, Falcon was six years old, Rio was eight, and Bradford was 10. And whether or not the boys realized it at the time, they were about to make their second TV appearance, and this wouldn't be on the next episode of Wife Swap. I don't know if it's because I'm a Virgo. I know Virgos have stomach issues. Oh my god! But <laughs> or it's just the food that I eat. I don't know what nasty it is. Barbecue. But anyways, I need all the help I can get when it comes to gut microbiome, and that's where Ritual has absolutely changed the game for me because what they created is a clinically studied three-in-one prebiotic probiotic and postbiotic which i never even knew there was such a thing as a prebiotic and a postbiotic but there is and rituals three-in-one prebiotic probiotic and postbiotic uses two of the world's most clinically studied probiotic strains to support the relief of mild and occasional bloating gas and diarrhea so why include a postbiotic well, it provides fuel to the cells that make up the gut lining and supports a healthy gut barrier, which is a win-win. Best of all, it's all included in this one single nested minty capsule. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There's no more shame in your gut game. That's why Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Just visit ritual.com slash mile to start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. So October 15th, 2009 was going to be a big day for the Heenies and this beautiful balloon, but not in the way that they thought it would be. That afternoon, they had planned on doing a test of the nearly completed 3D low altitude vehicle prototype. Falcon had apparently repeatedly gone into the basket of the balloon, which his father scolded him for. The plan was the balloon would be attached to tethers that would allow it to float 20 feet. It would lift thanks to 1,000 cubic feet of helium inside. The balloon was supposed to be tethered to the framework, and the Heenies were only trying to test out the vehicle, they just wanted to see if it would float up a few feet. So with Bradford behind the camera and the other watching the test, Mayumi and Richard counted to three. Here's what happened next. Three, two, 
One. Whoa. Oh my God. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Taylor! Yes. You didn't put the yes. Taylor in it! Dude is so aggressive. Chaos and sweet. Yeah, he is. He's scary, honestly. After this clip ends, the camera kept rolling, and Bradford shouted that Falcon was inside the balloon. Richard didn't want to hear it at first, and he kept yelling at Mayumi and telling his son to shut up. But then their son's words started to sink in. Bradford insisted that Falcon had actually crawled inside. So was Falcon really in the balloon? As they watched it float away, they came to the horrifying belief that yes, their six-year-old son was inside. So after this, Richard said he immediately called the FAA because he thought that they would be able to track the balloon the fastest. But when he talked to them, they told him to hang up and call 911. So Mayumi made the frantic 911 call at 11.29 a.m. Her husband stating that their six-year-old son, they had an experimental flying saucer that they built. Mm -hmm. They believe that um, their six-year-old son is in it and flying around. They left on him 20 minutes ago. And so it was an experimental plane? Yeah. It's a flying saucer. It's a flying saucer. Yeah. And is that, that's gone too, right? I'm sorry? How long is the flying saucer gone as well? Yeah, um, about 20 minutes, I think. It's been, they've both been missing for about 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta get my son. <laughs> okay. Yes, is this Richard? Yes, it is. Okay, how long has the six-year-old been missing? Uh, just a few minutes. Um, Was well, the flying saucer in the backyard? Yes. Okay, does it, it obviously has electronics where he can know how to work it and he gets it up off the air, off the ground? No, he doesn't know how to operate. He does not know how to operate. So, And that's gone, though, too, right? So we are sure that he's in that. Yeah, we... We looked everywhere, and then my son just said, "Be verified." And he said, "Yeah, he went inside just before it went off because we had it tethered. It wasn't supposed to take off." Okay, and was it running then? Well, it doesn't run. It's, 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 look, it's filled with helium, and it operates off of a million volts to uh, move left and right horizontal. Okay. And uh, we were testing it to find out what effect we could get. Okay. I, don't, I don't know whether it's possible you guys could detect uh, the electricity that it emits, but every five minutes. It comes on for one minute, and uh, it, it emits a million volts on the outer skin. Okay. And uh, a million um, volts, bro. I don't think that adds up at all. A million volts on the outside. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like he's bragging about his. UFO there's too. no way somebody on the inside of this balloon is surviving a million volts hitting the outside of this thing. Why would you ever put your kid in something like that? <laughs> oh my god. While Mayumi called the police, Richard called the news. He said it was because he knew they'd have helicopters and could have been able to find the balloon faster. Some reports say that Richard and Mayumi waited 20 minutes before calling 911 and that Richard called the news before the police. But what most likely happened was that they called the police simultaneously, which would be the smart thing to do, minus calling the news. So now imagine that you're back in 2009. Maybe you're sitting at home or sitting at school with the daytime TV on. President Obama is on screen giving a town hall when this suddenly comes on screen. I'm going to ask all three of you to hang on just a minute because we have rather an incredible breaking news story that we're following right now. And this is coming to us out of Colorado. What you all see right there is an experimental aircraft that inside of which is a six year old boy who got into that aircraft not that long ago and accidentally launched it. It's hard to believe, but it is absolutely true. It's coming to us. Uh, this is the balloon. Uh, it is coming to us from KUSA. The chopper is taking pictures. And I believe this balloon, again, experimental with a six-year-old little boy whose parents have created this experimental balloon inside. It's about 10,000 feet up. That's the approximate height right now, traveling at pretty wicked speeds right there. This is in the area of Greeley, Colorado. The family home, I believe, is in Fort Collins, Colorado. So apparently this experimental balloon was attached somehow to the house of the family creating it. 
it was tethered by a rope and the six-year-old little boy got into that balloon and somehow detached the rope. There's a wider shot perspective, everybody. Imagine the terror right now oh, of the six-year-old God. little boy and the family That's a ride far right away there. on the ground. Again, uh, estimates this being as high as 10,000 feet right now as it travels pretty quickly through the skies of Colorado. Uh, we don't have any information as to whether there is oxygen on board, whether there is anything other than this, uh, I guess, very rudimentary basket uh, <laughs> that is holding this six-year-old little boy. The boy's just ah. The newsroom is like, get a load of this shit. Like, <laughs> Did you see this at the time, babe? No. Really? Yeah. You no. didn't have a lot of TV going on. I didn't in have house. a TV, so. Yeah, right. We didn't <laughs> so have be able to see it. the news either. So. Do you remember it happening or hearing about it at the time? No. Really? Nope. Damn. I didn't. My parents didn't watch the news, so I don't yeah. even think they knew about it. I remember this so clearly watching this exact footage. I was at my grandpa's house in Miami, and my dad came running into the little back den that we had and was like, There's a kid flying through the sky in a balloon in Colorado. Like, we got to turn this on. And we started watching it. And I remember we were both like so freaked out. It was well, so intense. Everybody's like, This poor boy. Yeah. Scary shit. Because there's no way after watching that that this in, ends well in mm -mm. any way, shape, or form. Or does it? So these news helicopters had continuous live footage of the balloon gliding through the air at some 1,200 feet above ground. The nation was captivated by the bizarre story and all eyes were glued to the TV. So the police showed up at the Heaney's house minutes after Mayumi made the 911 call and they searched the bedroom's basement and garage, but Falcon was nowhere to be found. Police did check at a neighbor's house, but he wasn't there either. They also searched a nearby reservoir, woodlands, and a park with no luck. So as far as anyone knew, Falcon was in that balloon, flying through the sky, whizzing past live power lines and trees. And obviously, people were very concerned that the balloon would crash and Falcon would be hurt or worse. But people also wondered how Falcon would be able to survive all that time in a balloon that only had helium inside. The nation watched as 10 minutes became 30 minutes and then 30 minutes became an hour. The balloon was still airborne. Everyone was holding their breath, hoping that this six-year-old was okay. And really, all anyone could do was wait for the balloon to land. Planes in the balloon's path were actually rerouted for safety. Which, let's be honest, when have you ever seen a balloon land, right? Balloons deflate and then hit the ground. Crash. Yes. Yeah, so, so it, it felt like that was the inevitable. Like Everyone's just waiting for that to happen. Well, yeah, well, it deflates up in the sky and then it just drops out of the sky mm -hmm. after that. Especially if they're, you know, if he's inside. So, eventually the balloon did start to lose some of that helium and deflate. The balloon sagged and began to lose altitude. And it ended up sort of crash landing near Keensburg, Colorado at 1.35 p.m. And this location is just 12 miles northeast of Denver International Airport and 50 miles from the Heaney home. It had been in the air for about 90 minutes and hit an altitude of 7,000 feet above sea level. So about 2,000 feet above Fort Collins. If you are predisposed to do so and you want to say a little prayer, you might want to do so now. Uh, but clearly it's going down. It, by all accounts, there are, uh, Tamron, there are fire and rescue. In fact, yes. you can see something right there. And if this thing floats down a little bit slower the way it was going, this might David, be okay. It just landed. It has just landed. We see a gentleman rushing, Look at this literally guy. trying to cradle, Looking cap ass. capture the bottom attachment. Uh, this is a, a field. Ah, no pressure kind of or field. anything. It was a softer landing, I think, than anyone certainly thought it, it's when we started carrying this earlier. Susan, let me get you in here. What what are we, what are we seeing here for this oh, landing? I can't imagine a better scenario. A soft plowed field, no power lines, a gentle descent, people there to catch him. This is a very wonderful ending, I think, too, as long as he's okay inside. But boy, you couldn't ask for a better outcome. How incredible is that? Lester, you're still with us. We were talking about power lines. We saw houses in the horizon like, and now no an open screaming. field. And we're waiting to see any uh, 
signs of what may be going on inside the attachment. But what do you what do you perspective wise think of this landing we just witnessed? Well, you, you, what you couldn't hear is my audible sigh uh, <laughs> uh, watching this come down. I think I ours too. I think everyone. All of our heart, hearts were beating here. Uh, um, this this is, is the best possible outcome. Well, up to, up to the point where we find out he's okay. But in terms of the, the best possible landing um, scenario, um, to watch it float down like that. The compartment uh, is empty. There's no child in this balloon. The sheriff's department uh, is in pretty much disbelief. I'm still feeling a sense of dread. <laughs> oh my god, I can't even imagine. There is no child in this Surprise! <sighs> Well, I mean, you would think that this boy would be like screaming in there. Yeah, as well, you he's coming hear from down. The newscast, if he was. No, I know, but but, yeah. but like they would have been rushing over to it, trying to get him out. But mm -hmm. they're all just kind of like standing, looking at it, like, yeah, this is odd. Like, mm -hmm. how come he's not like, you know, there's no. Well, they were probably thinking because, or he maybe he's already dead in there. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I was like, get your yeah. asses in there. Or maybe they didn't rush to like touch it because it was kind of where they're standing around it. Mm -hmm. So cautiously. Well, probably because Richard said there's a million volts that <laughs> radiates around this thing every so often. Yeah, probably. So obviously the first responders ran over to the balloon to help Falcon. But when they checked inside, surprise, Falcon wasn't there. So now the situation became very dire because the authorities believe that Falcon could have fallen thousands of feet out of the balloon. So at this point, the mission turned into a recovery one. There had been reports of people seeing something fall out of the balloon. One onlooker submitted a photo that showed the balloon in the air with a small black object midair below it. And to investigators, this created a huge worry that that fuzzy object was in fact the young boy Falcon. The Colorado Army National Guard was quickly dispatched to find Falcon. Then they sent out Black Hawk and Kiowa helicopters on this recovery mission. Authorities waited for news back in Fort Collins with the Heenies. They had already searched the house themselves, but they didn't find any sign of Falcon there. Both Richard and Naomi were totally distraught, realizing that their son may not come home. But in an instant, the mystery solved itself. Falcon just walked out into the living room at 4.14 p.m. that day, perfectly unharmed. And Mayumi let out a scream when she saw him. Richard fell to his knees when he saw Falcon, alive and confused. Turns out Falcon had been hiding in a box in the attic the whole time, and he explained he had hid in the attic because he was scared of being punished for going into the balloon earlier. His dad had sort of snapped at him, and he was worried he was going to get in trouble. Now, Richard said he didn't think Falcon knew how to get into the attic, much less get up there by himself, but apparently he had. Falcon said that while he was hiding in the box, he played with some toy cars and then fell asleep. So everyone was freaking out and dude was chilling. Once Falcon came back out, everyone was obviously very relieved. And the news media had gathered outside of the Heaney home and they obviously had a lot of questions. And here's what the Heaney's had to say. I was in the attic and he scared me because he yelled at me. That's why I was in the attic. I heard Shaggy. I didn't want to come out really soon or else she would yell at me and I'd probably get in trouble. I yelled at him for going inside it. Uh, it's potentially dangerous if you get inside and the electricity comes on. Uh, he, he went up to me and went over like this. Um, I'm going to go sneak inside and then he went inside. So he said he's going to sneak inside? Mm -hmm. Okay. He told Bradford he's going to sneak inside. I'm, I'm really sorry I yelled at him. Yeah. We got him. <laughs> Scared the heck out of us. We were on the uh, sofa, and uh, Miami screamed, and he came out of somewhere. Where'd you come out of? Hello? Um, the attic. The attic. What did you think when the balloon came down and your son wasn't in it? Uh, that tore me apart. Uh, the only thing I could think of was that he had fallen out. And um, so I had to retract back in my mind, did he fall out? Or uh, how did it feel to see my son again? This is a relief. Uh, we're going to watch him a lot closer. Crazy. What do you make of his reaction there? Just like, it seems a little acted to me. Well, they are actors. I don't know. It's just like. I don't know. I mean, 
at the time. Because, like, obviously it. the controversy is, was this just an accident or a hoax? Did they actually, mm -hmm. like, set this thing up? Guys, I have to say, I am really the queen of typos and spelling mistakes, grammar issues. I have always struggled when it comes to composing my emails. Did you even go to school? <laughs> I did go to school. And that's where Grammarly comes in and saves the day for me. And they also help you with tone, which is really cool and unique about Grammarly. Grammarly's premium advanced tone suggestions help you communicate confidently and reframe your words to be more positive and productive so your team gets on the same page and projects get done on time. Confident communication suggestions help you build strong relationships and get things done at work. For example, maybe you're saying, we may want to consider providing an update. Grammarly will change that to, we should consider providing an update. Guys, take it from me. When it comes to working with your team, communication is key. And Grammarly's premium tone suggestions can take your writing to the next level, keeping you professional as you balance being direct and friendly while finding solutions with your team. The right tone can move any project forward when you get it just right with Grammarly. So go to Grammarly.com slash tone to download and learn more about Grammarly's premium advanced tone suggestions. That's Grammarly, G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash tone. Well, the family did an in-home CNN interview with Wolf Blitzer that same night. They said they had no idea the event had turned into such a media frenzy at first because they hadn't been watching the news. But it was something that Falcon said during this interview that turned viewers' heads. And this really changed the whole narrative. And Falcon was really in the garage this whole time. Uh, I don't know if Falcon can hear me, but... Was he, because uh, I know at some point he fell asleep in that garage, but he was hiding out because he thought you were going to punish him for something that happened earlier in the day. Uh, did he hear anything? Did he hear you screaming out, Falcon, Falcon? Uh, he's, he's asking Falcon, did you hear us calling your name at any time? Mm -hmm. You did? You did? Well, why didn't you come out? Um, you guys said that... Mm -hmm. We did this for the show. Yeah. No. <laughs> you didn't um, come out. No. What What did he mean? We did this for the show. <laughs> Wolf's not letting that um, go. I had no idea. I think he was talking about the uh, media. Had been asking him a lot of questions. So um, somebody had asked him that question earlier. You want to ask him now? I don't know if he can hear me. Uh, what he meant by what he said? We did this for the show. He's like, he no. His pants. <laughs> you you want to ask Falcon? Falcon, they want to know. Um, they want to know why you were in the attic, okay, for so long, and why you uh, say, say it again. Why, why he said at least he he said we did this for the show in explaining why he didn't come out of the attic. Um. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, let me uh, in interrupt this real quick because I think I can see the direction you guys are hedging on this because earlier uh, you had asked the police officers some questions. Uh, the media out front, we weren't even going to do this interview. Um, and I'm kind of appalled after all of the um, feelings that I went through up and down that you guys are trying to suggest something else, okay? I'm really appalled because... Uh, they said out in front that this would be the end and I wouldn't have to be bothered for the rest of the week with any uh, shows or anything. So we said, okay, fine, we'll do this. So I'm kind of appalled that you guys would say something like that. Uh, you know, it's... No, no, I, I, we, we're, we're not asking anything oh. unusual. Uh, you were asked earlier about if this was a publicity stunt. You say it wasn't. The police say it wasn't. The rescue operation say it wasn't. The only thing I just wanted to clarify why Falcon had said earlier, we did this for the show, and I, I, I just <laughs> wanted to clarify. I didn't understand what he was referring to. Well, you know, we were on uh, Y-Swap a couple of times. So the camera crews out there, I would imagine, um, they'd ask him a couple of questions in reference to this. And... Um, I believe, you know, he meant uh, something to do with that. Mm. Uh, Busted. Uh, I think it has to do with that. Uh. 
He, so bad. He knew exactly what was going on right there. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh no, they're not going to do this to me. <laughs> After the Wolf Blitzer interview, things started to shift. Before, people were captivated by what seemed like a near tragedy. The incident seemed too bizarre to be anything but a science experiment gone wrong. But now people started to believe that the whole thing was a publicity stunt. And the authorities quickly grew suspicious too. But the Heenies continued to maintain that they truly believed Falcon was in the balloon the whole time. The family continued to do interviews with the media, trying to explain their version of events, and these interviews were just as bizarre as the first. In two of them, poor Falcon actually vomited mid-interview after the Heenies were asked about, we did this for the show comment again. Got a quick clip of that. By the way, warning, vomit. Yeah. Kind of throws up a little if you don't like vomit. Poor kid. I feel so bad for him. Yeah, it's sad. And um, anyway, somebody had asked him if they could show, he would show them uh, how he got in the attic. So he was obliging them. And uh, one of the guys told him it was for some. Um, Mom. One of the guys told him it was for some uh, TV show. So that's what he was referring to. That's what he was referring to when. Uh, like, I'm just keep going. Yeah. Right. He's like, ignore him. And I know I, wa- I want to point out that uh, the sheriff's office said last uh, night that they believe your account of what happened, but, but they do want to question you a little bit more. This poor kid, the stress. And we were, of course, uh, getting interviewed. Falcon? You okay there? You okay there? Mm-hmm. You sure? He's uh, extremely He's tired. Quite awake. No, Mom, I feel like I'm going to vomit. Oh. The brother's you like, okay, I'm gonna buddy? screw him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, hell no, not on me. Yeah, putting these kids on the news, like, um, like, um, should, should we should we take you to the bathroom or something? Yeah. Should we take you to the bathroom or something? Good buddy. Yeah. Uh, there's some there's a wire here on him. So again, this comment about it being about the show really came back to haunt the Heenies. But about five years later, Falcon gave his explanation as to why he made that comment. He said that one of the reporters had asked him that day to show him how he got into the attic for a TV show. So that's why he said what he said in that Wolf Blitzer interview. Do you mm. believe him? No, I don't. I think they like were trying it. Because it still doesn't make sense in the context. Why would, that doesn't, why would they be asking that for the show? Yeah, and they asked why you didn't come out when your name was called. That has nothing to do with them filming for the show. I mean, I just don't, I think that's their best attempt at it. They're trying to spin it to yeah. try to deflect away from the, I think the, the real kid thing here. spoke the truth as children do. That's why he's vomiting because he's like, yeah. I'm basically being told to lie. On and, national TV. Yeah. How stressful. In front of cameras and everything. Like So two days after the incident, the police in Larimer County asked Richard and Mayumi for interviews. And they agreed to take separate polygraph exams. The results of those polygraphs have not been fully released. During Richard's polygraph, the examiner noted that he was dodgy during his questioning. He wrote, Richard said he was living with type 1 diabetes. He appeared on the verge of falling asleep when the investigator's questions became more accusatory. Love that. Gets heavier, he's crashing out. Oh, yeah. You know who this guy reminds me of? Who? Stan Romanek. Yes. He's got the same energy yes. as good old Stan. You know, I was thinking he reminded me of someone, and that is definitely who it Funny was. Funny that Stan's from Colorado, too. We've got a lot of weirdos a lot here. Of, uh... It's the lack of oxygen. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but Mayumi's interview is where the truth supposedly came out. According to a sheriff's affidavit, which was used to secure a search warrant, Mayumi admitted that the balloon was all a hoax. She said that she and Richard wanted to attract attention towards the science show that they had pitched to producers. The balloon incident would get them the media attention that they needed to get the show off the ground. Uh, No pun intended. Okay. How does this make any sense whatsoever? You're going to try to pitch to a network. We want our own TV show around my wacky inventions. Well, this was wacky as fuck. No, I know. But the liability of these (laughs) inventions would never make it onto a show. Like, come But on, maybe dude. they figured, you know, if, if he, the nation gets invested in so the balloon incident that, in this family. So he was hoping that even though that it's a potentially a hoax, 
they'll still want to sign me exactly. to a show. Because I got it. That's how his mind works, man. Dude. It's all about the attention. That's called Bring the people dangerous. In. Yeah, it's called dangerous. So Mayumi said that they came up with the plan two weeks before the incident. But the woman who did the second Wife Swap episode said that she helped construct the balloon, which backs up their story that they had been working on it for eight months. Also, I feel like there's another explanation. The fact that so obviously they thought the family thought that the balloon saucer itself would be enough to get the media's attention. And, you know, it's one of his inventions or whatever. And at first it was working um, with the production company actually wanting to work with them. And the deal ends up falling through. And of course, the bills start piling up. So now they're like stuck with this balloon and all of these bills and don't know what to do. So they had to figure out a way to get the production company to pay for the show and how to entice them. So they came up with the hoax. And that would be explaining why, like, they had all this extra helium and, mm -hmm. like, you know, all the other things to continue on their experiment. But what production company is going to want to be involved with a hoax or a hoaxer? I mean, I, maybe they would. How does that help them at all? I think it would have. If, what if, show if it, if it, have you ever watched is like, welcome to Richard's <laughs> Science Show, where we just do a bunch of hoaxes on here. Well, they weren't. The goal was for this to not be found out as a hoax. It was like the crazy family whose kid gets in the experiment yeah. and makes it on national TV. That was the whole vision. That maybe a network would be like, oh, now the nation's invested in these heeny people. Yeah, I think this was like a, their original plan to be like part of the show. So it's like, we'll get our five minutes of fame. Our yeah. name will be so recognizable that they can't possibly not sign us. Exactly. Put the news clips in the trailer for the show, bring the people in. What people does are Richard hooked. Heaney have up his sleeve next? Exactly. And I mean, yeah. it worked to some degree because people were so invested in the whole story. I mean, if you put this as like the pilot episode, yeah, this is what happens. Yeah, like, here's what really out, happened that day. Right. Find out what happens next week on whatever the fuck Richard... These whack the, asses. Yeah. What will they do like, next? I would totally tune in for the yeah. next week. <laughs> I mean, I would tune in. So on October 18th, three days after the accident, the Larimer County Sheriff, Jim Alderden, made an announcement. He had concluded that the Heenies staged the whole balloon incident and they'd be facing charges for it. And people were pissed. I was pissed. <laughs> I think the world was pissed. At the time, Falcon weighed 37 pounds and there was a specialist at Colorado State University who determined that with the measurements of the balloon, that Richard gave, the balloon could have lifted Falcon. But when the specialists actually got a hold of the balloon, they found that the balloon actually weighed 18 more pounds than Richard originally claimed. And with this added weight, it was not possible that the balloon could have lifted off the ground with Falcon inside. The sheriff recommended that Mayumi and Richard be charged with conspiracy, contributing to the delinquency of a minor in attempting to influence a public servant. Mayumi's confession was key to pressing these charges. But Richard argued that Mayumi's confession couldn't hold up. He pointed out the fact that she was not proficient in English. So he said that she couldn't have properly understood and responded to the polygraph questions. He also said that Mayumi didn't understand that she could stop the interview at any point and ask for an attorney. Plus, Richard said he tried to get legal counsel, but since it was a weekend, he couldn't get a hold of anyone, which is bullshit. Call Frank Azar. <laughs> that dude answers <laughs> night, day, and every time in between. Personal injury lawyer. It's true. Shout out to Frank. <laughs> FDAs are. So at one point, Richard asked one of the investigators if he could help him find an attorney. And the investigator said no. But luckily for Richard, he was able to later find an attorney named David Lane. Many members of the local community came out to show their support for the Heenies. Neighbors spoke to the news media insisting that the family was innocent. They felt that the charges were unfair and a violation of their rights. Supporters left posters and notes of support all over the Heaney's yard. And of course, Richard wanted to fight the charges. He maintained that the whole thing was an accident, not a hoax or a publicity stunt. They had fully believed that Falcon had crawled into the basket and was inside when it accidentally launched. But the prosecutors allegedly put the Heaney's in between a rock and a hard place. According to David Lane, the Larimer County DA told the Heenies that if they took their case to trial and Mayumi lost, they would start the deportation proceedings against her. However, the DA's office has denied saying this. So now they were allegedly forced to take a very risky gamble. Richard decided that he couldn't risk his family like this, as he couldn't imagine Mayumi being ripped away from her home and her kids. Here's Mayumi reflecting on this. Mayumi, did you 
actually think you could lose your kids in all this? <laughs> yes, I did. You thought somebody would actually take your boys away from you after all this? And I thought I'm, uh, I'm going to be deported. Yeah. Then I won't see my husband or you know kids. I, I won't be able to see them. So my focus was in a, a hope of family together. So because they didn't want their family to be torn apart, the Heenies pleaded guilty on November 13, 2009. Mayumi pled guilty to a misdemeanor charge of false reporting to the authorities, and Richard pled guilty to a felony charge of attempting to influence a public servant. On December 23, 2009, Richard was sentenced to 90 days in, baby, and 100 hours of community service. Man, I'd love to see him on that show. 90 days in, Richard on that Isn't show. Isn't it 60 days in? Or sorry, yeah, it is 60 days in. So, but, but a 90 day edition 90 for day him. 90 day edition for him. That would be a wild episode. Yeah, that would. He would not do too well. I'm sure prison or jail was not a fun time. Mayumi was sentenced to 20 days in jail, and her sentence would be completed via two days a week of jail supervised community service. Mayumi was allowed to start her sentence after Richard's so the kids could be cared for. They were also ordered four years of supervised probation, and the judge banned them from receiving any kind of profits from the hoax. Richard was ordered to give a formal apology to all the agencies that searched for Falcon, and he started his sentence on January 11, 2010. We don't have an exact number of how much the search and rescue operation cost, but it was a lot. They estimate it was around $2 million. E the search helicopters alone cost $14,500. Because remember, not only did they have local authorities, first responders, they got National Guard involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the FAAs involved. There are Big so many deal. resources involved in this, all the news stations. So it adds up quick. So originally, the agencies and DA's office sought $48,000 in restitution, but after some negotiating, the family agreed to pay $36,000. Richard Heaney served 30 days in jail, and the terms of their probation stated that they couldn't profit from the story until 2013. The family then moved to Bradenton, Florida in August of 2010 after the incident. Miami homeschooled the kids to keep them out of the media's prying eyes and the family has lived in Florida ever since. Here's some new neighbors learning about the move. TV was so much better back then. <laughs> but a new family moved in with a reputation and a rap sheet. Remember Balloon Boy? The flying kid named Falcon, the media frenzy? It all turned out to be a hoax. They lived in Colorado, but now they're here. You're kidding. <laughs> Joe Buccolo and wife Kathy live in Waterleaf <laughs> too, but had no idea the Heenies were now their neighbors. You gotta be kidding me. Here? Yes, Joe, here. <laughs> We're gonna have Such forces people. all over that neighborhood now. Sooner or later, everybody comes to Florida, kids. Remember that. Come to Florida. <laughs> the family moved to Florida to live with Richard Lee's <laughs> mother. It's true. And they're trying to keep a low profile these days. At their front door, the only greeting we got was a note that read, No interviews, but please have some cookies and milk. Hell yeah. In Bradenton. Eric Waxler, ABC Action what? News. Wait, they left milk out in Florida? Cookies and milk, baby. Interesting. Like Santa. I bet right. you it's just like maggot infested bowl of <laughs> cookies and milk to try to scare people away. But also <laughs> okay. make a nice gesture <laughs> at the same time. That's disgusting. Have some cookies and milk if Did you Did they dare. have like a chilled cooler for the milk? I'm so yeah, curious. They've about got the a fridge out there. They've got an oven. They just got them <laughs> hot and fresh. Like Otis Spunkmeyer cookies. I bet you they're eight. So good. Mm. So good. Oh, yeah. Don't get me started on Otis Slugmeyer. <laughs> Don't get him started for Wait, real. Wait, why? You really are into those? Oh. They're so Josh good. lives for a good chocolate chip. I would chip eat like oh, same. 10 a day probably. Like. Did your school sell them? This is so off topic. Yes. Uh, I think like same. every school did. Mine did. So good. Mm. Delicious. Anyway, this is way off topic now. So in 2011, Richard auctioned off the famous balloon itself. To a man in Aurora, Colorado for 2500 bucks. And that man was me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I plot wish. twist. That'd be cool. I wish. I would have I 100% bid on that if, it, if I had been capable of... Kind of a deal. Yeah, seriously. It's a relic. That is a relic. I've got a question for you. What's your love language? Is it physical touch? How about time together with your partner? 
people get turned on in all sorts of wild ways. Dipsy has invented a whole new love language with sexy stories for whatever mood you're in. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters that you'll be sure to never forget. Discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups. Radically inclusive, Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. Gotta love it. You've never heard celebrities like this before, I promise you. Listen to stories voiced by Sarunas J. Jackson, ER Fightmaster, and Luke Cook. New content is released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories you can read. Mm, turn it up. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to fire up your me time. Explore your wildest fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up to a whole new level with a partner. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended, you know what I mean, 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash mile higher. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash mile higher that's dipsy stories.com slash mile higher so he stated that these proceeds would be donated to tsunami victims in japan the public especially many coloradans were transfixed by the balloon boy incident clearly we are some of those coloradans in fact in 2014 students at monarch high school in Louisville, colorado put on the show balloon boy the musical. The musical was written by a student named Billy Reese, who'd been working on the project since seventh grade. Super committed. Let's, let's a... see some clips of the musical. It's final dress rehearsal. Oh. The weather balloon is not yet inflated, but cast members at Monarch High School are pumped about Balloon Boy, the musical. The message is just as relevant today, maybe more so, as online stunts seem to go viral every day. Cast member, Junior Solomon Abel, who plays father Richard Heaney, says he watched old footage to inspire his performance. He appeared on like live television in an aluminum suit and stuff like that. So yeah, he's just really a crazy guy. <laughs> so this is kind of like a dream role almost. A dream role. And what about Balloon Boy, I wish I could Falcon have seen this live. He's played by freshman Michaela Aiken, who says she feels bad for the youngster. That he got wrapped into this at such a young age. But Michaela insists the play, making its debut this week, is exactly the kind of attention the Heenies would want. I think that they'd be thrilled that there's a musical about them. The, back? <laughs> the aliens, of course. <laughs> That's awesome. So I wish I could have seen mm -hmm. that live. So after that uh, news interview where they literally like dox the Heaney family in their new neighborhood. <laughs> like go get some cookies at the <laughs> like, Heaney house. <laughs> like what? Here? So obviously they probably saw that come out and they're like, oh, we got to get out of here once again. So they moved, but they stayed in Florida and the boys grew up. They all had a knack for music apparently and they started to get into heavy metal just like their papa. Rad. The three of them actually performed their own heavy metal band called the Heaney Boys. Man, that's badass. Kenny Boys with a Z, that is. Bradford was on the guitar, Real was on the drums, and Falcon was the band's front man. Richard booked them gigs, and they performed for crowds as small as five and as big as 2,000. Big range. One of their songs is named <laughs> Bloom Boy No Hoax. Bloom Boy No Hoax. <laughs> it's like a lot. Here's the song. I gotta hear this. You gotta give it to these guys, you know? The wig is awesome. The creativity is there for sure. No hope! 
Look, they have him on the balloon flag video. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking awesome. Kinda lit, not even gonna lie. Oh! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, my ears are bleeding, that's okay. enough. I was gonna wonder how long we're watching that. Oh. <laughs> wow, this family. <laughs> On December 23rd, 2020, the Heenies were pardoned by Colorado Governor Jared Polis. He felt that the Heenies had already been punished in the court of public opinion, and it was time for the state to move on from the spectacle from a decade ago. David Lane, the Heenies attorney who helped them get their pardon, said it best after 11 years, quote, the balloonacy has ended. <laughs> Good one. Wonderful. To this day, everyone in the family maintains that the balloon boy incident was never a hoax. So obviously Richard Heaney is elated to have been pardoned. And get this, he is still selling his bear scratch back scratchers online. Remember how you said you wanted one, Josh? We can get one. Oh, I'm getting one. <laughs> we'll get one for the office and we'll show it. Oh, yeah. Actually, we'll just put it in my back corner right behind me. So yeah. in the middle of the episode, if I got a scratch, I can just go back. <laughs> Josh is <there>. just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So now that he is no longer a felon. He could potentially appear on Shark Tank. Oh, he the next gets big shredded thing. on Shark Tank. That would be some good TV, though. They should get him on. And Richard is still creating other inventions, including a small box fan that he calls the Blow Jab. It's designed for farmers to keep their junk cool while they're working. When he's not doing that, he and his sons work on house renovations. Of course, Richard does still have to worry about his family's reputation now, which is still marked by the 2010 incident. At some point, he realized that a lot of the change had to come from him. He said that for so long, his family did whatever he told them to do without any complaints or questions, but he thinks that the balloon boy incident and the fallout was a message for him. No more Richard shit. And that is a quote from Richard himself. He wants to stay out of the spotlight now and have some privacy. Here's Richard discussing this. The family now lives in Florida. Richard still maintains that it wasn't a hoax and says he was a victim of character assassination. And how, after you stack all that stuff, throw in the interview that was on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, you throw all that together with a background you have, why won't pe why wouldn't people go? This is another hit what? piece. This is another hit piece, which I anticipate. Here? Yeah. What is it going to take to change public opinion that you know is still out there mm -hmm. about what happened 10 years ago. What would be nice is if the media could actually go, yeah, Richard's got a point, but it's, but, it, but it's so biased, okay? The media continues on with the same narrative. And all these years later? Do you feel a sense still that you need to clear your name? Oh, most definitely. Still, 10 years later? Yeah, oh yeah. Why is that still so important to you? I've lost many opportunities. I've lost a lot of opportunities. I've had people contact me about things I've invented, and the deal went south. And, um, you know, because they find out who I am. And the thing that gets me is the media never tells my side of the story. He says the incident has been a learning experience for his family. How has this impacted you all? Oh, man. It's had a very positive effect. Positive. Very positive, because... I, I, I closed off our family to the outside world. And I just said, you know, we're gonna to go to homeschooling, uh, we're gonna go do activities together, and I'm gonna be the guy that spends time with them. It sounds like you're saying this incident actually made you all a, a tighter knit family. Yes, we are definitely a tighter knit family. Love his jorts. Good look. <laughs> I love his tank top too. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. He's definitely doing, looking like a Florida man now. Since the whole incident went down, Mayumi Heaney has now become a naturalized U.S. citizen. She is still the silent backbone of the family. And Falcon Heaney says he doesn't remember much about the Bloom Boy incident since he was so young at the time. He seems to be doing well today, and he's a good sport about the whole thing. He and his brothers like dirt biking, making YouTube videos, and working on renovating houses with their father. Here's some more of Falcon and the Heaney's talking about the incident 10 years later. Boy, anybody ever throw that at you these days? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> but you're laughing about it. It's, yeah. It's just wait, it happens a lot? Yeah. What's your reaction to it? I'm just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He says he doesn't remember <laughs> oh, yeah. much about the incident that earned him that nickname, but his dad, Richard, certainly does. Surely you know. 
this was not just some little story that was going to go away. You know that, right? Um, afterward, you know, um, after the fact, I mean, it just never dawned on me. Falcon appears and, you know, I, I didn't know there was I mean, actually, we, we didn't have a TV uh, hooked up, so I had no idea what was going on. We, we don't really want to associate ourselves with that. We, we just want to rock out. Do you have any mm. current TV or reality show uh, opportunities in the works? No. Do you, would you take an opportunity, a reality show, any TV opportunity? Or would you rather get out of the spotlight at this point, given what the spotlight has done to you? Yeah, I don't want to be in the spotlight. Okay, okay now I'm sitting here with you with a light in my face, you know, because <laughs> of this. Seems People so need to know this right here, this truth. But now my, my boys, they love playing music. They love uh, performing. And it's a real passion with them. So if any opportunities come down a pike, I hope it's for them. Robert Sanchez, a reporter for Denver's 5280 magazine, did a story on the Heenies in 2019. And with Mayumi's approval, her lawyer allowed Robert to look at her case files from 10 years ago. What Robert found was interesting to say the least. In that box of files, there are lots of photocopied past due notices from 2009. In one letter, the Heaney's bank had reached out to let them know their account was overdrawn and being canceled. Robert also saw a contract between the Heaney's and the production company that would have made their science show. There was also a sheriff's report that stated the filmmakers were not going to do business with the family anymore. So clearly, the Heaney's were in some sort of financial trouble. During 2009, they had lost the deal with the filmmakers. But the most interesting thing Robert found was a collection of notes written from Mayumi. It appears that this was a rough play-by-play -play of that year leading up to the Balloon Boy incident. Mayumi evidently wrote this to get her attorney up to speed after the events of October 15th, 2009. The first entry was dated April 27th, 2009. Mayumi wrote that for five months, the production company pitched the reality show five times, but they were rejected each time. She wrote, what could we do to help them? They wouldn't put up money, but we can do our own project then they can make a one-off out of it. In other words, the two of them mass production, you know, what they could do to help get the show going in production basically was like, just do your own thing and see where it goes. And then maybe after that, we can actually help you. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty typical for a lot yeah. of, yeah. you know, people trying to get shows. The next few entries from early October describe Richard working on the Flying Saucer. An entry from October 2nd says, we shot intro of this project on the couch with the kids. On the next day, Miami wrote, we started building a flying saucer and shooting the process inside the house because it was snowing. But then the entry started to get more suspicious. For October 6, Miami wrote, we have a video of Falcon saying, I want to get inside of it. For the October 14th entry the night before the incident, Miami wrote, quote, at night, Richard asked me to remember about the story of Lawn Chair Larry. Then Richard mentioned what if Falcon hid for a half hour later and landed. Then mentioned in newspaper Fort Collins, Falcon can hide in the closet with a safe in a basement. And if you guys don't know who Larry Walters is, basically he was this dude that back in 1982, he created this aerostat um, using a patio chair and 45 helium weather balloons. And he ended up flying around for 45 minutes and the aircraft rose, aircraft, I use that term lightly, rose to an altitude of about 16,000 feet. Higher than the mountains. Yeah, here. and it started in San Pedro, California, and eventually entered controlled airspace near Long Beach Airport. And during the landing, the aircraft became entangled in power lines, but luckily he was able to climb down from safety. But Dude, kind of that's iconic. badass. Yeah. That's awesome. I wonder if this is what it's inspired some... up. Maybe. This is the entry for October 15th, the day of the incident. It says... To my understanding, we're never going to launch the flying saucer because the strong wind changed our mind. Because of the wind, it might crash on somebody, cars, or anything. Richard said we would do the third test and quit. That's why I thought he was acting so strange. After the flying saucer went off, he went so hysterical. Because he started so hysterical, I started taking it seriously. After it was launched, we did not know whether Falcon was in the flying saucer or in the house somewhere. The entry from October 18th says... I found out when we visited our attorneys that Richard revealed he came down to the basement to look for Falcon, but he wasn't there. Richard thought, really, Falcon would be in the flying saucer. So if these notes are an accurate recollection of events, this could be what they mean. The plan was the event would be staged and Falcon would hide in the basement like he was told. 
the Heenies would film the balloon taking off and the staged drama that ensued. Richard would call the FAA, they'd track the balloon, and Falcon would miraculously appear from the basement. Richard would call the FAA back and tell them the good news. Falcon was not in the balloon. The story would be strange enough to get the attention of the newspaper in Fort Collins, and from there, the story would take off and go nationwide. The Heenies, who already had some reality TV experience, would have production companies lining up at their door to produce something starring them. It was a bizarre plan, but in their minds, it was supposed to work. But instead of hiding in the basement like he was told, Falcon hid in the attic. Richard and Mayumi couldn't find him. Maybe he had misheard their instructions. As police arrived and neighbors started to search for him, they started to believe that Falcon really crawled into the balloon. Do you believe this is a possibility? I do. Yeah, I think it's possible. I don't know what to believe, honestly. I think it's possible. I don't think it's completely like even if they had concocted this whole plan and it it's just went po- wrong. Well, that's the thing is like you're you're dealing with young kids. Yeah. And I mean, you're putting a lot of trust in these young kids to not yeah. actually like do what you're trying to make appear to be actually happening. Right. It would make sense to me with their reaction on the news footage after they had found him. They, he did seem very concerned and it, yeah. it seemed pretty genuine to me. But again, who knows? Actors. So it's, hard to, <laughs> actors. it's hard to tell. Hollywood actors here. <laughs> Robert called Richard and asked about what he had found. Richard asked where he got the notes and if he could see them. Robert could hear Mayumi in the background denying she wrote anything. He emailed over some pictures and Richard called back two days later. Richard told Robert that none of these things ever happened. Someone had told the family about lawn chair Larry days after the incident, and the note was mistaken. Robert asked Richard whether or not he had actually suggested Falcon hide in the basement. But before he could say anything, Mayumi said, I made the whole story up. I wrote it, and she started to cry. Richard started to yell. He said, what do you mean you wrote this? What the fuck are you talking about? You said you didn't know what this was. Why would you write this? Mayumi cried, to save myself because of our kids. And Richard started yelling, telling Mayumi, every time you write something, you cause a fucking shitstorm. And the two went back and forth with Richard yelling and Mayumi crying. Robert asked Mayumi if she made up the story she wrote in the notes to her attorney, and she said yes. Richard asked her to uncover her mouth and repeat herself. Once more, Mayumi said yes. And that was that. Seems very controlling and staged to me. I mean, Richard's like borderline abusive, honestly. Oh, I I would say At least verbally abusive. In certain ways, for sure. And there's probably so much we don't know that would paint a different picture of him. But yeah, I anyway, mean, it's very I mean, it's very obvious that there is at least some level of planning with this mm-hmm. and whether or not it was just their, you know, the hoax plan went wrong. And then when they couldn't find him in the normal spot he was supposed to be in based on the plan, they actually started freaking out that he might be in the balloon. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. That's believable to some degree. I mean, I know that, I guess I don't know, but it seems very likely to me that there was some hoax involved, that there was a plan. It's pretty obvious. And I think the biggest piece of evidence for that, aside from all these notes, is the kid just saying. Part of the show. Yeah. Like right on live TV and his reaction immediately. Yeah. I mean, freaking it's pretty shit. telling. Yeah. I mean, he didn't try to be like, what did you just say? Or, you know. He just immediately starts covering and you can tell he's like trying to figure out what to say and kids don't lie or they do, but not very well. How'd Falcon get in the attic? How many kids know how to get into their attics? That's another weird thing to me too is like, how do you know to get into the attic? Because yeah, I I think they showed it was like in the garage. I'm pretty sure. He misunderstood. He like went up into the attic in the garage. You can see like a panel taken out or something. I'm like, how'd he get up there? Unless he had help. Mm. So I think, and that's the thing is he, it's a convenient excuse. Maybe he thought it through that much. Like maybe we make it look like the hoax went wrong and I actually really believed it. But you know, he almost created his own like fail safe in this, this hoax yeah. plan in a way. He's like, the original plan was he go in the basement. He must have crawled into mm-hmm. the balloon. He didn't do it. Small it I, local right. news story. And so he, I actually thought he was in the balloon the whole time. Mm-hmm. And so and that, that could be accurate. So maybe it's, you know, a little bit of lies mixed with a little bit of truth I, I equals a whole lot of bullshit. I mean, I don't think Mayumi's like 
making shit up when she no. wrote that stuff. But I don't think so. Either. Obvi- and it's clear. Why would she? That all of them at some point were like terrified of Richard. Yeah, it seems that like way. Like they were like, if you go against anything that he says or his plans. Well, for Falcon then- to be so stressed out that he starts puking because he know he's probably was coached on what to say and was nervous about messing it up, all the cameras and everything. Yeah, they were under a lot of pressure. And then, then, I mean, I think he, Richard was surprised that things blew up as much as it did to the point where it was like, he's now got the national news. I think kind of they're, they're, they thought that at least that this would be like a local news thing and then it would just kind of like die down from there maybe, but maybe he knew it would go national too. I don't know. Yeah, just I don't, know. the world may never know the truth about the Balloon Boy <laughs> hoax. So we want to know what you guys think. Let us know in the comments below Do as you think usual. He really hoaxes from start to finish, or did he hoax it and the plan just went wrong and he actually thought that his son was in the balloon? Let us know. Or was it all real? Yeah. Or was he in there? But that is going to be it for us today, you guys. Of course, we will be back next week. But until then, keep on taking your mind as high as Balloon Boy. Wow. Wow, that was fucking <laughs> terrible. I thought it was good. 